to see everybody this morning here at Mount Olivet as we gather together to worship our Lord and Savior together. Those of us that have gathered in person and those watching us online, good to have everybody here uh, this morning. It is the fourth Sunday of Advent, which means that Christmas Day is just a week from us. And so we can celebrate that uh, today as well. I hope everybody's got a copy of our bulletin inside. There are a couple of inserts. Uh, first are all the names of those who have been... Uh, poinsettias have been given in honor of or in memory of. So make sure you take a look at that. Uh, if you did, in fact, order a poinsettia, uh, please remember that um, if you want to take it home with you, you got to get it out by December 25th because our offices are going to be closed the 26th, 27th, and 28th. So you need to get it before then if you want to, want to take it home with you. Uh, inside is also our prayer list as well as a few announcements. I want to hit a few uh, high spots if I may just real quick. Again, remember that uh, today, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, we're having one service at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary starting January 8th. We're back to our 8.30 and 11 o'clock. Uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we're having a Christmas hymn sing here in the sanctuary. And everybody's invited to come and sing a few of our favorite Christmas hymns. So do make sure that you come uh, and do that. A reminder that beginning on January 1st of 2023, all the way through December 31st, 2023, we're endeavoring as a church family to read the entire Bible chronologically. And we're going to be using curriculum from the Bible recap to do that. joe has got books in her office uh, for you to take a look at. If you want uh, any of the actual printed materials, uh, make sure she knows so she can order them for you. But there's also a podcast, there's also the plan on your phone, if you have a Bible app on your phone that you can use, if a little more technologically way is your preferred path. We'll also have printed out the plans beginning next week, so let me know if you have any questions, or Joe, if you have any questions as well. Again, next Sunday is Christmas, which means the day before is Christmas Eve. And here at the church, there are three opportunities for you to worship with us. We have a noontime uh, Christmas communion service here in the sanctuary. At 3 o'clock is our family Christmas pageant. Uh, that gives anybody and everybody, regardless of your age, to dress up as either a wise man, a shepherd, or an angel and participate in a pageant. There's no lines to learn. All you got to do is put on a costume and do what the instructions are as we go through the service. But it's a lot of fun. Folks that came last year had a big time. But that's at 3 o'clock on Christmas Eve, then that night, 7 o'clock, is our candlelight Christmas Eve service. Hope that you can make it. This afternoon, um, we're putting together food boxes for those in our community who need a little help during the Christmas season, and we need some volunteers. If you are available to help unload trucks or pack boxes or take boxes from the fellowship hall to the cars of folks that show up to get them, be here at 1.30. Uh, many hands make light work, as they say. So if we can get a number of volunteers here, that would be fantastic. Uh, SC wanted me to pass along to everybody here and those watching at home, uh, thank you uh, for all the ways that you have reached out to him uh, and his family at uh, Miss Jean's passing, those that have called him and stopped by and brought stuff. Uh, it means more to him than he can uh, properly express, but he just wanted everybody to know a big thank you from him and his family for all you've done for him. Uh, and let's not stop. Let's continue to pray for and love on Mr. SC uh, over the next few weeks, months, and years. Uh, we love you, SC. Malcolm wants a few minutes to give us an update on health care here in Dare County. So I'm going to invite him to come up and talk to you for a little bit. It's not really about health care, uh, it's about prayer. Uh, and it's about prayer from this congregation. I'm reading Matthew uh, 4, 23. Jesus went out throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness amongst the people. And the people brought to him all that were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, those suffering from demon possess possessions, those having seizures. Um, the power of prayer of this church has been remarkable over the last few years, in a few months, um, in the issue that many of us are dealing with. All of us will deal with it. 
and that's health care. Uh, there's not a person in this audience, this congregation, that is immune from the need of health care. Who do we go to when we're in that need, as our preacher and his family did? First, I'm sure it went, he went to the Lord. And what did the Lord provide? Health care workers, a doctor, nurse, maybe even a, a minister in the, in the church. Your prayers, your support, have been amazing to participate in this walk. In six months, less than six months, we have a medical group, a faithful, a, a group that is very faithful from Hyde County that has a lease on a building in Manio. They will be open, we hope, by spring. The hospital, I believe, has heard your prayers because their work has been intensified in recruitment and retention of doctors. We have new doctors here in Manio, and that is good. And I don't believe, and I honestly witness to you, that this would not be possible with that God at the helm. As I said before, I felt like Jonah in the belly of a fish. Why me? I still don't know why me, but when I prayed to God, I don't have the ability to deal with this. May I turn it over to you? He does have that ability, and the purity of love has been amazing of the people that have stepped up. And again, it's because of this congregation. Y'all have led that prayer. Hope, peace, joy, and love. For those that are needing medical care, the hope that they need, whether that medical care be in the physical body or addiction or mental illness, they need that hope. They need that peace. And that can only come from the love of Jesus Christ, and he has provided that. And to each one of you all, I'm thankful. Um, another passage before I close. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them the authority to cast out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. For those that are involved in health care, I apologize for not holding you up and appreciating you as I should. Many of you all are sitting in the pews now. To each one of you, your family, the sacrifice, the service you give our community, I thank you and I believe each one of you in this congregation thanks him too. So in closing, if I could pray. Dear merciful and graceful Heavenly Father, the God of the universe, past, present, and in the future, a God that knows every hair on our head, who sent us your Savior to save, the, save us from our sins. You've also provided disciples. Those disciples take many forms, but today I celebrate and ask a special blessing in prayer for all those that come to heal us. Bless them in this celebration of Christmas. May we lift them up. May we encourage them. May we thank them. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Malcolm. Well, let's uh, put our hearts and minds together and go back to the Lord in prayer as we start our time of worship together. Gracious and Holy One, we give thanks to you for gathering us in this morning, whether it be in person or those watching through the miracle of technology. Uh, we thank you 
Our gospel lesson this morning gives us that beautiful name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. We thank you for your presence here with us this morning. We thank you for your promise to always be with us no matter where we are. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells inside each and every one of us. We ask that he opens our hearts, our minds, and ears to this worship service and teach us those things that we need to know. What areas of our lives need to be strengthened? What areas of our lives need to be straightened? And of course, Lord, we give thanks to you for the ultimate gift of a Savior, Christ Jesus, one that we do not deserve and can never earn, but that you give to us freely because of your abundant love for each and every one of us. We give you thanks for all the ways that you shower us with your grace, your mercy, your hope, your strength, and your comfort. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I want to invite you now to stand as you're able as we sing our opening hymn. It's found on page 251, Go Tell It on the Mountain, page 251. be seated. You notice in our bulletin that the Stetsons were going to light the Advent candle for us this morning. They unfortunately uh, have caught a stomach bug and are unable to be with us this morning. However, the Duprays have volunteered to take their place. So I want to invite them up now as we light the fourth of four candles for the Advent season. Matthew 1, 23 through 25. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. We light these candles to light a joyous hope of proclaimed peace, of deep everlasting joy, and today of the presence that speaks of love, as a sign that no matter our circumstance, we know we are not alone.
For our family, love during the season means being together. Please stand and join us as we sing praise together. Countless days on a journey that led so far. Endless nights they traveled to follow the star. They did not find a palace, just a humble village home. And searching for a king, but finding a child, no proud, no throne. Still they bow down, come let us adore him, oh come let us adore him, oh come let us adore him. Expectations turn to For nothing was like anything they dreamed. And anticipating the royals and those honored by this world, instead they gazed the awestruck eyes of a lowly peasant girl holding her child come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore The fragrant myrrh, the ghostly frankincense, place me for him. Come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let. Adore him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we are gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. He has come for us, this Jesus. He has hope for all mankind. He has come for us, the Messiah, born to give us life. 
God, our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same, how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. He has come for us, this Jesus. He's the hope for all mankind. He has come for us, Messiah, born to give us life. All the angels sing, Alleluia, Jesus Christ is born. All the children sing, Alleluia, He is Christ the Lord, He has come for us. This Jesus, he's the hope of all mankind. He has come for us, the Messiah, born to give us life. He is born to give us life. our younger disciples to come up front and join me for our children's moment. you guys a question as you're coming down. Um, which do you think is prettier? These weeds that I have in my hand or one of these poinsettia plants that we see here in the front and also up here by the altar? Which do you think is prettier? The poinsettias, the poinsettias right? Obviously. So I'm going to tell you a little story this morning that's called the legend of the poinsettia. All right, it takes place down in Mexico, all right? There's two people, Carlos and Maria. Yes? Um, I already know about it. You already know about it? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you did. So, well, then you, you let me know if I get something wrong as I'm telling this story. What you got? Poison it's not poison ivy. <laughs> what do you mean? How's that poison ivy? No, it's not. You don't touch it. <laughs> Legend of Point said it goes like this. And again, you tell me if I get it wrong. You have two folks, Carlos and Maria, who live in Mexico. And they don't have a whole lot of money at all. Okay? Every year at Christmas time at their church, though, they have this beautiful nativity scene, right? And what people in their community would do is they would take presents and bring them to church and put them. <laughs> Uh, in this nativity scene as if they were gifts to the baby Jesus. And people would come from all over bringing all kinds of gifts. But poor old Maria and Carlos, they didn't have any money. They felt bad about that. But still, they wanted to go to the Christmas Eve celebration. So they went to church on Christmas Eve. And as they were walking to church, an angel appears to them. And the angel tells them, go out in that field and get as many weeds as you both can possibly carry and take those to the nativity. And the angel disappeared. Well, Maria and Carlos look at each other, kind of like, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but if an angel tells you to do something, then you need to do it, right? So they go out in this field on their way to church, and they gather up all these weeds, as much as they could both carry, and they take them to church. Now, by the time they got to church, people were already sitting in the pews, right? And as they make their way into the church and head toward the nativity scene, 
people started to laugh and to giggle and to kind of make fun a little bit of Maria and Carlos. Why are they bringing just a bunch of weeds into church? Well, the story goes that Maria and Carlos bring these weeds and place them into the nativity scene to where they surround the manger where the baby Jesus would have been laid. And then all of a sudden, those green, wilted leaves turn a bright, bright red. So that Jesus is then surrounded by that nativity scene with this beautiful vision of color. Now, the point of the story is this. We oftentimes like to say that nothing is too big for our God. Well, the opposite is also true. There's nothing too little for our God either. Because he, all he wants from you, the gift that he wants from you is your heart, right? What Jesus wants from you is your love for him. And he can take that little bit of love that you can give to Jesus right now, and he can turn that into something remarkable. Jesus doesn't want from us shiny, new, extravagant gifts. All he wants is our hearts. Right? What were you going to say? That's true. That's exactly right. All right? So, as small as you are, as little as you are, you have something very valuable to offer Jesus. And that something valuable is your love for him. All right? Let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this time of year where we can celebrate his birth. Help us to remember that the only gift we need to bring to him are our hearts, our minds, our love, and our faith in him. Help us to do that each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Thank you.
Thank you, choir. Well, friends, we come now to our time of prayer for and with one another. just want to remind you of a few things. In each and every pew is one of these prayer request cards where if there is someone, something, a situation you want our church to be in a fervent prayer for, I encourage you to fill one of these out and drop it in one of our two offering boxes once worship has concluded. If it's something personal, something private, something you won't know just between you and I, then still fill one of these out, but place it in my hand once worship has concluded, uh, or just drop it on my desk uh, on your way out. If you're watching us online, I encourage you to take advantage of the comment function on whatever uh, mode or mechanism you're using to watch us. We always come back through after worship has concluded to gather up all the prayer requests to make sure that your prayers are covered as well. Uh, our prayer this morning is a responsive prayer. Uh, after each petition, you'll hear me say, Lord, in your mercy. And if you feel so led, I invite you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. So again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy. And you'll respond by saying, hear our prayers. Toward the end of our prayer time together is a space of silence where if there is a person that you want to lift the name out aloud, a situation you want to lift out aloud, uh, please do so. If you'd rather keep it just between you and God uh, silently, certainly that is also the time for that. And do also know that our altar rail is always open before, during, and after worship to where if you feel led to come forward and pray in that fashion, I encourage you to do so. But my friends, as we await the coming of Christ in mercy and majesty, let us pray for the church, the world, and for all people according to their need. Let us pray. O come, Emmanuel, our Lord and God, our King. Come with healing and blessing, with light and life. Come and save us all from sin and evil and endless death. Lord, in your mercy. O wisdom, proceeding from the mouth of the Most High, fill the church with your spirit. Sustain and order its worship, proclamation, and works of charity according to your most holy will. Come and teach us prudence, Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Adonai, ruler of the house of Israel, rule also in the lives and works of your people in this congregation. Give us your word and show us your glory. Look with favor upon all who seek to be your disciples in this place. Come with your outstretched arm to redeem all of us, Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Emmanuel, the ransom of your people, deliver your persecuted servants from torment this day also. Keep them faithful and steadfast. Help us to honor their witness and provide for their needs. Turn their tormentors from their evil ways. Come and teach them courage. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, bright and morning star, you gladden the hearts of those who sit in darkness. Shine on all who are overwhelmed by despair confusion, hatred, or unbelief. Come and lead them into the brightness of your holy love. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, King of the nations, the ruler they all long for, unite all people under your glorious and gentle reign. Teach us the things that make for peace. Come and save us whom you formed from clay. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Root of Jesse, you stand as an ensign before the peoples. Guard and guide all who stand in harm's way in defense of justice and freedom. Come quickly and deliver them. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O key of David, you open what no one can close. You close what no one can open. Free all who suffer and are imprisoned by the powers of sin, evil, and death, especially those we name before you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts.
Lord, in your mercy. O oh, day, spring, splendor of life everlasting, keep safe in your mighty arms all those who died trusting in your promises. Come and enlighten us who still sit in the shadow of death and open wide our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant to us, dear Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we pray together as one family, the prayer he still teaches us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, our sermon text and gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in the first chapter, and we'll take a look at verses 18 through 25. So again, this is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. It says, Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Well, friends, a couple of years ago, this is when we were still serving in Camden County, <clears throat> I was part of a program known as the Reynolds Foundation Program in Church Leadership. United Methodist Church clergy from Western North Carolina and North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, North Georgia, and the Florida conferences are nominated by their home conferences. And from all of these preachers, they select 24 to participate in the program. I was blessed enough to have been one of the 24 selected. It's a one-year leadership development program that meets once or twice a month where we discuss ways to better serve and lead our congregations. Part of the curriculum that we went through was a variety of personality profiles and leadership strengths and weaknesses that were meant to give us a better idea of our own personalities, our own quirks and things of that nature. And it was really no surprise to me that my results showed time and time and time again my tendency to want to micromanage and to have my hands on just about everything I possibly could. If something is going on, I want to be a part of it. I want to be in on it. I want to make sure through my own efforts that the task is completed and gets done. Imagine, coach, a quarterback getting a play from the sideline. He has three options. He can pass it to a receiver. He can hand it off to a running back or he can keep it himself and run, I would have been the quarterback keeping it himself and running it time and time and time again. Because I like to be the one in control. And it's been that way as long as I can remember, honestly. 
Back when I was still a practicing lawyer and had just entered into seminary, I was taking a class called Mentored Ministry, where they partner you up with a clergy person nearest to you, and you basically follow them around one or two hours a week. The preacher I was matched with, I remember telling me that every day he comes into the office and he starts out by listing all of his to-dos on a piece of paper, but invariably something's going to happen during the course of the day where you can just take that piece of paper, wad it up, and throw it in the trash can. Because something's going to happen to make all those to-dos impossible to do. But I remember thinking how ridiculous that sounded. After all, if you're the one in control, how could that possibly happen? I mean, if you couldn't manage it or fix it or handle it yourself, I mean, who could? And how could that lack of control not drive you crazy? I want to come back to that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about Joseph. Because our gospel reading this last Sunday of Advent tells us the other version of the Christmas story, doesn't it? Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way, it tells us in verse 18. Unlike Luke's account, Matthew makes no mention of a census or shepherds or multitude of angels. Instead, he tells us of a scandalous pregnancy and a quietly planned divorce and then a dream-induced change of plan. We have here Christmas from Joseph's point of view. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Joseph. He's not recorded as saying one word in any of the Gospels. What we find out today, though, is that he is a descendant of David, and he's a good and righteous man. He seems to be a thoughtful kind of fellow. Because he considered his situation very carefully, and he wanted to avoid shaming Mary in any way. So he made a plan to deal with the situation quietly and quickly. He seems to be the kind of man that you would want your son to grow up and be. And the kind of man you would want your daughters to grow up and marry. But Matthew makes it abundantly clear in our story that as righteous as he may have been, as good as he may have been, Joseph lacked one thing, control. He may have been the theoretical head of his emerging household, but he was clearly not in charge. God was, as God always is. And God was working out a story much bigger that Joseph could have ever imagined. Eugene Peterson, in his work entitled Eat This Book, suggests that this is how it is supposed to be for you and I as the children of God. He says, when we submit our lives to what we read in Scripture, we find that we are not being led to see God in our stories, but our stories in God's. God is the larger context and plot in which our stories find themselves. The challenge for Joseph, for you, for me, is that we tend to think the other way around. We generally imagine ourselves as the central figure in our lives. And this is a result of our limited and finite natures. We can only see through our own two eyes, which happen to be laser-focused on our own concerns, our own responsibilities, and our own capabilities. And this leads us to think and act in ways which are remarkably narrow and usually selfish at times. But in this text, God is opening Joseph's eyes to see something bigger. This was the function of the dream that we read about. An angel from the Lord expanded Joseph's perspective to see how Mary's pregnancy was, in fact, the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Just as Isaiah had prophesied eight centuries earlier, God was coming to be with his people in the flesh. This child would be God's instrument for saving his people from their sin. He would put his and their and our enemies to shame. And it was this promise that broadened Joseph's perspective. It changed his mind and then determined his course of action. 
Certainly he was still afraid and he needed a few other dreams to kind of help steady himself. But he was now emboldened to be faithful. And this man without control took Mary to be his wife and served as the adoptive father of Jesus. And in doing so, Joseph fulfilled his smaller part in God's much bigger story. So what about you? Have there been moments in your life, or moments even now, where you are aware of your own lack of control? That as much as you try to manage your families and your holiday schedules, your health, your work, your attitude, our society, and a host of other things, does life not sometimes have a way of putting us in our place and reminding us how limited we really are? And our response to this lack of control often includes unrighteous and selfish behavior. And you can probably think of specific examples in your own life. Well, here's mine. This past Thursday, I woke up and Heidi was still complaining of a chest pain that she had experienced for a day or two prior. We discussed the options of whether she should go see her primary care physician in Elizabeth City or take a trip to the urgent care up the beach. She asked for my advice. And as one who, again, likes to be in control, I did a mental rundown of everything I had coming up on Thursday. Youth breakfast at 7.30. Miss Jean's celebration of life at 2. The senior adult dinner at 5.30. And if there was time, off to Manuel High to see them play basketball against first flight. All sandwiched in between reading and research to get ready for today's sermon. And because the urgent care was presumably quicker and closer, we thought that would be the better path, and that's what she chose. So I headed off to the youth breakfast that morning, and our daughter Caroline took her to the urgent care. <clears throat> a little after 8 o'clock, I got a text that said they had run an EKG and some other heart tests, and everything seemed fine. They were going to do a chest X-ray just to make sure, but they expected that to be fine as well. Then about 8.30, I get a phone call. It was her. She was being sent to the hospital with a collapsed lung. Now, I'm no doctor, so I didn't really know what to expect. But in my mind, I saw this as a minor hiccup to the day. <laughs> <coughs> I arrived at the hospital to her room in the ER just in time to hear the doctor explain what the plan was because he thought she was no more than a third or so collapsed they were going to put her on an oxygen mask for four hours to see if that would take care of inflating the lung, and if so, she would be able to go home. I looked at my watch and slowly started to realize that the day that had been planned out was not going to happen. There was not going to be any controlling of the day by me from that time forward. They ordered a CT scan as a precautionary mat matter, <clears throat> wheeled her out, brought her back in, and about 45 minutes later, the doctor comes back in, takes the oxygen mask off of her, and says, you actually had a 50% collapsed lung, and we need to do a surgical intervention. Now, friends, I have been in countless hospital rooms and nursing home rooms and home visits, but again, those are all situations where I have some measure of control. I control when I show up. I control how long I stay. I control when I get to leave. But there will be none of that now. I couldn't fix it. Did I feel helpless? Yes. Yes. Was it a little bit aggravating? You bet. And initially, I was uneasy with how now the whole day was shot. I felt guilty for missing Miss Jean's service. I was sad that we would have to miss the senior dinner. I was unhappy that I wouldn't get to see any of the basketball games. And all of those feelings, friends, because of a lack of control on my part, 
we're all admittedly and ashamedly very selfish. But I needed that. I needed to sit with it and reflect on it and refocus and reorient my thinking even a couple of days later about my perceived need for control because as I did reflect on it, I started to find comfort. I was reminded of a thing or two. And I started to find this particular lack of control to be actually good news to me. You say, how is it good news? Because of names. When we found out that we were having a son, obviously one of the things you have to decide upon is what is it that you're going to name your child. Now, being the good Carolina man that I am, I proposed the name Roy Dean for our child. <laughs> in honor of our two favorite basketball coaches. Now, that idea was immediately shot down and with great prejudice. So we changed it. And it seems like there's some name changes going on in our story, doesn't it? The angel says to name the baby Jesus. And then Matthew turns right around and tells us, yep, that's the one, little baby Emmanuel. And no sooner does Matthew write that than we were told, that, yep, Joseph named him Jesus. Jesus, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Jesus, which is it? Do we have to choose? Well, no. Unlike Heidi and I picking one name over another, in this case, friends, no choice has to be made at all. You cannot speak one without invoking the other. Jesus is Emmanuel. Emmanuel is Jesus. And Emmanuel and Jesus is God with us. That name, whether you use Emmanuel or Jesus, is how a lack of control is good news. It is good news because it reminds us that the one who has all control over everything has come to be God with us. When we relinquish control, we can find comfort in knowing that we are not alone, that we are taken care of, and we can be comforted by that because God is with us, not some far-off, uncaring, unfeeling, stone-hearted deity on high. No, here, with you, with me, with all of us. God with us in all our flesh and blood realities and messiness. God with us nursing at Mary's breast. God with us in learning to eat small pieces of bread and drinking from a cup without spilling milk all down his chin. Christ among the pots and pans, as Teresa of Avila puts it. Christ among the barn animals and then those quirky magi astrologers that show up and then all the rest of the gospel's curious cast of characters. Yes, friends, God with us. God with us with the prostitutes and lepers and the outcasts in whose company Jesus would delight in again and again and again. God lifting the cup of wine to his lips. God with us. God with the little children whose warm brows he touched and blessed. God smiling when a baby is shown to him by a new mother. God with us in all of our ordinary days and times. And God with us, as Jesus would say to put an end to the book of Matthew, with us even until the end of of the age. God with us always. Emmanuel. And friends, Emmanuel is God with us in that hospital room as all I could do was look on helplessly and as Heidi fighted to stay calm and brave. Emmanuel is God with us in all the texts and calls and emails I got that day and the days after offering support and prayer and care. Emmanuel is God with us when pies and meals and visits and flowers find their way to our doorstep. Emmanuel is God with us when I have conversations with folks here or in the Dollar General or at the Wright Brothers anniversary where I feel just how much our family is cared for. And friends, Emmanuel is God with us when I have to remember for myself 
the same message I try to bring to you each and every Sunday, and it's this. Ever and always, Jesus stares straight into you with his two good eyes. And he does so not only when you can smile back, when things are going exactly to plan, but most certainly also when your own eyes are full of tears, your mind full of distractions, and your heart full of doubts when things are not going the way that you had planned. In fact, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with you, even in those times when you are so angry with God that you refuse to meet his eyes. Because even when you feel like you can't look at him, he never looks away from you. He can't. His name says it all. And so no, I nor Heidi had any control over the situation this week. But God did. In all the ways that I mentioned, in all the ways I did not, God was there. Offering us comfort and hope and love and peace. With his presence. And his presence through all of you as you reached out to us. And truthfully, friends, I needed that reminder this week. I don't need to control everything. God's got it. And so friends, as we close, I want you to think about those things in your life that you feel like you have to control, but you can't. And I want you to release those things. Friends, if we proclaim that we believe in God's providence and God's will and God's timing, then we have to be bold enough, friends, to let go and let God, as the saying goes. Find that release of control to be the good news that it is because you are putting it in the hands of the one that made the universe and promises to be with us always. Emmanuel. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> well, friends, we pause for a moment to um, just think about the ways we are all blessed. The goodness that God brings to each and every one of us. And if you felt a calling or a leading this week to bring a tithe, gift, or offering to our church, and you've not done so yet, I encourage you to drop it off in one of the two offering boxes uh, once worship has concluded. Uh, but friends, it is in deep, heartfelt appreciation of your faithfulness as well as anticipation of future gifts that I want us to put our hearts and minds together now and go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God of hope and promise, When your children were in deep despair, you promised them a sign, the indication of a Savior coming into their midst. As we bring you our tithes and offerings this day, so many of us may be discouraged in trying to find our own way. We need your sign. We need your Son, not as simply a reminder of history, but as a new direction, a revolution of love that starts in our hearts, a resurrection of compassion that looks beyond self and the accumulation of more and more things that don't satisfy. We need what only a Savior can give us. Guide us by your signs on this day and as we begin the journey to Bethlehem once again. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, I want to invite you now to stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymn. It's found on page 249 of our hymnals. There's a song in the air, page 249. <laughs>
My friends, as you and I make our way to Bethlehem over the next week to celebrate our King, let's travel light. Take whatever is holding you back or holding you down. Take it to the foot of the cross and leave it. Let us all journey together and celebrate Emmanuel, that God is with us. We go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.